Hey, this is Tom from Tom's Epic Gaming, and in this video, I'm going to be going over my list of top tier cards for Epic Card Game Constructed. Instead of going over these cards alphabetically, I've ordered them into a bit of a narrative to help explain them as a whole. So let's get started. First, we have Raging T-Rex. And yes, in a game where the average champion is about a 6-6, a 12-10 that also draws two cards is just as powerful as you think it is. Not only is it a slow, one-cost card that's actually worth playing on your turn while your opponent's gold is up, which is pretty rare, but it's also one of the best turn one plays, period. It's a draw two and card that gets you both ahead in card advantage and on the board immediately. However, the must always attack clause can be a real problem if your opponent has bigger or recurring champions in play, but if they don't, you generally want to attack with it anyway, so you don't actually care that much. This is another reason why it's particularly strong at the start of the game when the board is empty. What's really fun though is using this drawback as a smokescreen to make your opponent think you're being forced into making this bad attack, and then when they make the seemingly safe block, play one or more buffs to really punish them. This is why I frequently like to say, must attack if able when I attack with T-Rex, just to get that thought into their head. And then later in the game, say it to make them think I have a buff, even when I might not, so they might make a suboptimal block, effectively punishing themselves. Aside from this though, if you are already at 7 plus cards in hand, an extra 2 attached to a body that won't do anything else until your next turn, and might just expend itself every turn getting chump blocked, isn't actually that impactful and constructed. It does let you cycle out your situationally worst cards in hand, and possibly get some key cards into your discard pile, but other cards will frequently be better to play in that situation. However, discarding cards like Smash and Burn can be pretty nice. And speaking of Smash and Burn, it's the other top tier wild draw to and card. While the plus 5 plus 5 can certainly be relevant, the real power comes from the ally ability from your discard pile. Being able to break a 6 defense champion, once again, the average champion defense, in addition to whatever else you were spending your gold on anyway, is a massive tempo swing. This can break pesky utility champions, it can clear out a blocker, or it can provide a boost to the one cost wild damage effect you used to trigger it. Also, if you have multiple of these in your discard pile at the same time, you can use them all with the same trigger if you want to. Smash and Burn's obvious weakness, though, is that it can be banished by discard pile hate cards before you can spend a gold to actually activate it. Further, its prevalence in the meta has caused people to avoid including six or less defense champions that are worthwhile targets for it by itself. But as a side note, you can still play this, even if there are no legal targets in play, since FX and Epic choose their targets on resolution instead of when played, so you'll still draw the two cards, you just won't buff anything. With these two powerful draw two and effects, Wild needs ways to utilize these extra cards, and that's Brachiosaurus. Essentially, Brachiosaurus is a zero cost card that doesn't take up the zero cost deck slot, has bonkers stats with Breakthrough, is effectively immune to zero cost removal, and can even be chained to trigger wild ally abilities up to five times in a single turn. This can either be played before any one cost wild card you were planning on playing anyway, or frequently better, you can play this and then pass with your second wild gold available. If your opponent does play something, you can still play what you were planning on playing anyway, or you can now play, spend your gold on a gold punisher while they're less likely to be able to respond to it. But if they just pass while your second gold is up, you still just got an uncontested slow 8-12 breakthrough into play, which is still pretty nice. While this is, in many ways, just a better zero cost card, the restriction of only being able to play it before you spend your real gold for the turn is not trivial. You can't spend your real gold see if they board clear, and then follow up with this to maintain your pressure afterwards. And, if you play this and you both pass, 
you didn't actually apply any immediate pressure that turn, which can be too slow at times. However, if this can bait out your opponent's gold before you spend your second one, Wild does have access to one of the best gold punishers in the game, Strafing Dragon. Guaranteed 5 damage to the face or champion removal, and the immediate threat of an extra 6 airborne damage on each of your turns attached to a body that survives all zero cost removal can be effectively played on either turn, and if they try to stall by bouncing it, they've committed themselves to at minimum 5 more damage to the face. In other words, it kills mid-range decks before they can stabilize, and control decks have no effective ways to answer it. It cashes in on everything Raging T-Rex, Smash and Burn, and Brachiosaurus set up to actually win you the game. But all of this is only true while your opponent's gold is down. With a gold, Strafing Dragon is significantly easier to answer effectively, and in that case, a gold for 5 damage just isn't strong enough. Also important to note, having the damage tied to loyalty can make it harder to use in hyper-aggressive decks that can quickly run through their hand. These four wild-only cards are the core behind successful competitive wild decks. They have some of the best cards at getting you ahead immediately and using that advantage to snowball you into a win. More aggressive decks frequently fill the remaining slots with burn, while more mid-range decks tend to focus on higher value champions. Another frequent addition to any type of wild deck though is the non-wild exclusive Surprise Attack. Surprise Attack makes already powerful non-ambush slow champions even stronger. For example, you can use Surprise Attack to ambush your Brachiosaurus or T-Rex into play on your opponent's turn, preferably while their gold is down, get all those sweet benefits, and then immediately attack with them on your turn. In addition, Surprise Attack adds itself to your discard pile essentially for free, which helps with recycling and can actually matter. However, Surprise Attack is also a trap. If you run free in a deck with minimal one-cost champions, your hand can fill with events, making this an essentially dead or at best high-risk card. To decrease the chance of this happening, if you do get low on cards and down to one one cost champion in hand, it can absolutely be worthwhile to just use your surprise attack to play that champion instead of playing that champion normally. In other words, just play your surprise attack on turn with a slow champion or off turn with an ambush champion. While not great, it at least cycles you into a different card and you might even draw into a better champion for the situation since you do draw first. Also important to note, while playing Surprise Attack will trigger wild ally triggers, the champion it puts into play will not trigger ally triggers. Finally, and I do need to emphasize this, it does not make one cost slow champions that are bad worth including, at least for competitive play. While it can be reasonably powerful when you get these cards together, if you don't get them together, it's horrible. It can cause one of them to just rot in your hand, and there are just frankly stronger combinations with other inherently powerful cards. One such inherently powerful card that's amazing with surprise attack is Kong. Remove a champion and get one of the biggest champions in play. Great. Do it off turn, particularly after your opponent spends their gold. Obnoxiously great. One downside of Kong is that it doesn't do much against wide decks, though, unless you can give it breakthrough. Further, without surprise attack, it does take a while for it to actually attack, which can give your opponent enough time to actually remove it before it can. Although, getting it bounced isn't too heartbreaking, since you'll be able to replay it, assuming you're neither dead nor applying too little pressure to combo or control decks for it to actually matter. Another inherently powerful card that's insane with Surprise Attack is Sea Titan. Very similar to Kong, remove a champion, get a massive body into play, absolutely worthwhile as a one cost card on turn. The big difference between the two is that Sea Titan's untargetable makes it immune to significant amounts of removal. 
but this does also prevent it from gaining targeted breakthrough, which means it has the potential to be constantly chump blocked. However, assuming no opposing buffs, Sea Titan does safely block about two thirds of all of the champions in Epic, with most of that remaining one third having some form of evasion, like Airborne. And only board clears and non targeting removal can deal with Sea Titan, aside from that rare combat scenario. Surprise Attack, Kong, and Sea Titan are hyper effective at winning the board, and have therefore pushed a lot of other decks out of the meta. That being said, Sea Titan and Kong have been falling out of favor because they've just been too slow to pressure control decks. Now that we've gotten the most obviously powerful cards out of the way, next up are the cards that many seasoned card game players initially gravitate towards. Muse. <sighs> Ever since I lost in the Origins Constructed Finals in 2016 to my opponent playing three Muses against me in my mid-range good deck with no effective answers to them, twice, I've had a vendetta against this card. So, when I got a chance to help design a card, naturally, this happened. And it was quite cathartic. But that's still not going to stop this rant. Muse is so powerful because it's an ambush zero that can just sit back and never expose itself to combat, while drastically decreasing the amount of gold you need to spend to draw cards. Drawing two cards a turn instead of one means you can play one, one gold, high impact, non-drawing card on your turn, and one, one gold, high impact, non-drawing card on your opponent's turn, infinitely, until they use an effect specifically to remove Muse, or you play enough non-recycling zero cost cards to deplete your hand. For this reason, it is almost always wrong to attack with Muse, because offering to trade this insane advantage for 2 damage, or 1 15th of your opponent's starting health, just isn't worthwhile most of the time. Unless of course you have 7 plus cards in hand, and or you know your opponent has no ambush flyers, nor spike trap, or you're trying to do something tricky, like draw out an airborne blocker, or buff your Muse post blockers, your opponent's at 2 health, etc, etc, etc. I feel so strongly about this though, even with all those caveats, that the best way to put me on tilt is just to casually attack with Muse, particularly if I can't punish you for doing it, because this also means that Muse already survived a turn. In desperation, or if you no longer need card draw, this can also be used as a zero cost ambush airborne chump blocker, because I wasn't strong enough already, right? Luckily, Muse must survive a turn before it can actually start drawing. This does give zero cost removal a small window to answer the Muse before it has much effect. Certain zero cost removal can even put you ahead in the trade to really punish the Muse player. And as someone who frequently plays decks that rely on pressuring my opponent out of resources, by negating opportunities for them to spend gold to draw cards without dying, I always feel essentially required to include at least some of those cards. To be fair though, due to a meta shift towards punishing Muse, it has become significantly worse to just casually include it. But that did not stop it from making to the finals of Worlds 2017. At least every alignment has a powerful punish for it now. Thought Plucker. Thought Plucker, as the one cost version of Muse, is also insanely powerful. For one gold, you get the Muse spend less gold to draw effect, in addition to the force your opponent to spend more gold to draw effect. Simply, if your opponent only draws one card on their turn, and you force them to discard one card on your turn, they naturally net zero cards drawn. This forces them to spend gold to draw to prevent quickly running out of cards. In addition, when played, Thought Plucker immediately nets you a 1 card advantage over your opponent, 2 cards if they remove it without incidentally drawing. Because you ambush this in on your opponent's turn when their gold is down, and because every hit is the net equivalency of 2 draw 2s, your opponent must remove this if able, and 
if they have to spend a gold, you get to play whatever punish you want, a Blitz Champion, more discard effects, etc. Final Task and other recursion effects are particularly strong punishes that can crush all but the most resilient decks. For all of these reasons, this was considered, and perhaps still is by some, the strongest card in the game. However, it can be quite weak to counterplay. For example, if both players are at 7 plus cards in hand, an ambush 1-1 one, one isn't as immediately threatening. It also won't directly stop you from losing on the board. Further, it does die to a significant amount of zero cost cards, which can allow your opponent to gain a critical gold tempo advantage. It even needs to attack for further effect, which not only makes it vulnerable to more zero cost removal, but crucially, it gives your opponent initiative to make plays to either remove plucker, draw cards, or otherwise impact the board. Finally, some cards actively want to be discarded, or can be recalled essentially for free if they are, and if your opponent is running these, Thought Plucker can be more of a liability than a boon, unless you have discard pile removal in hand. In other words, if the possibility of Thought Plucker isn't respected in deck construction, it is one of the best cards in the game, otherwise, Hope your opponent doesn't draw their answers and or their punishes, or you might just get blown out. One of the most ubiquitous cards post the Rise of Plucker is Ancient Chant, the best card draw card in the game. Usually, this is draw three for one gold. Play it, then recycle it from your discard pile later. If your opponent banishes it first, you still get that third card draw anyway. Against slower and or discard decks, you can spend a gold to recall this, netting you plus two cards in hand, or effectively two draw twos. Even just discarding it to a plucker and recycling it effectively neutralizes that discard effect against you. This is one of my most played cards by far. Even though Ancient Chant is top tier in its own right, its combination with Lesson Learned is where it truly shines. If you play Lesson Learned targeting your Ancient Chant in your discard pile, you draw four cards with one gold, or effectively three draw twos. While this interaction is the main reason Lesson Learned made it to top tier, being able to choose and immediately replay any event in your discard pile is powerful as well, since there are a lot of powerful events in Epic. One of the most powerful is a race. In general, draw to and effects are strong, like Raging T-Rex and Smash and Burn. Bounce effects are also strong in Epic, since if you bounce a one-cost champion, while it can be replayed later, your opponent will never have more than one gold a turn to replay it, with a few exceptions. This card, in conjunction with Sea Titan, are two of the main reasons why non-Blitz, non-Ambush, non-Tribute or Loyalty, non-Untargetable champions are effectively unplayable. If your opponent is able to get a powerful effect and remove a gold champion which did nothing when played, you've fallen very far behind and it'll be very difficult to win from there. Due to this, bounce effects have played a large role in driving the meta towards strong tribute or loyalty champions because you at least get something if bounced. Champions that can do direct damage when played, like Strafing Dragon, are particularly strong against Bounce, because it doesn't matter how far ahead in tempo or card advantage an opponent gets if their health hits zero. Another powerful event that can be strong with Lesson Learned is Wave of Transformation, or the Answer Anything card. Nothing is untransformable yet, and since this doesn't target, it can stop untargetable champions too. This can even stop Wolf or other tokens, because this replaces them with new Deploying Wolf Tokens. If you want an always active, one-turn respite, this is the card. In addition, if you do have champions in play when you use it, they become prepared wolves that can block potentially non-evasive on-turn blitzing gold punishers. However, even though this saves you from one turn of attacks, if your opponent went wide with a lot of champions, 
those two two wolves will still be there next turn, ready to bite your face off. Further, there are some cards that can immediately use those wolves to apply pressure if your opponent's gold is up. If you go with these strong one cost non sage only cards, there's the zero cost sage amnesia. In Epic, every deck uses their discard pile for something. Whether that's recycling, recalling, discard pile triggers, or other recursion. Amnesia puts a brief halt to all of those and replaces itself. As a side note, combo and control decks generally rely much more on their discard pile than aggro decks. Finding the exact right time to use this card can devastate an opponent's plan, even if you're just turning off Recycle for a couple of turns. Also, as long as you have at least one mass discard pile banish effect in your deck, it becomes effectively impossible for your opponent to win by decking out, even though that's largely impossible anyway in Constructed. Amnesia can even be nice for breaking the symmetry of certain powerful cards. Since none of these cards have Sage-only requirements, they are frequently found as packages in a wide variety of competitive decks. Wild Sage or Sage Wild have been the most common decks in the entirety of Epic Constructed competitive history. However, while they have won some qualifiers, they have consistently been overshadowed by the less popular Control decks. Kark decks dominated Worlds 2016, even though they were small in number, and they dominated the constructed qualifiers afterwards. They were particularly oppressive to those Wild Sage decks, which represented at least 50% of the field. This largely illustrated the need to ban the next three hyper-efficient defensive cards. And, since they are banned, I'm not going to spend too much time on them, but I am going to touch on them briefly. Blind Faith. The two reasons why Blind Faith was too powerful because it could stop anything, anything, for one turn, for free, and it got you closer to critical combo or control cards. No breakthrough, no blitz, no airborne, no unbreakable, no untargetable, no unblockable, no static effects, and no expend effects. Pure attack and health buffs from cards like Rage are the only things unaffected. Essentially, it closed the few windows of opportunity against control and combo decks that you must exploit in order to keep them down and eventually beat them. Its only weakness was that it cost three zero-cost slots, but the good zero-cost slot wasn't too heavily contested. Fine, it can't stop a flame strike if you're at 8 health, unless of course you recycle into playable health gain first, sure. But it can make it much harder for your opponent to actually get you to 8 health. Ceasefire. Similar to Blind Faith, this lets a control or combo deck negate its primary weakness. It lets you safely draw cards without creating an opportunity for the opponent to exploit. It stops all future attacks with a turn and prevents on turn one cost blitz punishers. It's quite powerful in combination with incidental or recurring chump blockers as well as Blind Faith. Excellent target to recur to play multiple times in a game as well, such as with Lesson Learn. It had no real weakness and minimal possibility for counterplay as long as the control deck could block the initial attack, negating the effectiveness of a possible group attack. Since you can never play Ceasefire on your opponent's turn before they make their first attack, because that's the first time you gain initiative. Fumble. A card you could play for free when your gold was down to effectively negate any single attack and then replace itself, or draw two. When played against you, it almost always felt like your opponent spent their gold for the turn on it, especially since it can effectively be an inner piece that recycles instead of having recall. For zero. And, if you play more champions to get through it, you're just setting yourself up to be board cleared. Once again, it could close a window of opportunity against a control or combo deck. All three of these cards were too efficient at protecting control and combo decks from their main weakness, drawing cards without the possibility of being punished for it. Even without these cards though, Control, with the help of a new tool in Pantheon, remained strong enough to win Worlds 2017, 
after winning World 2016. Next are the cards that enable control decks to actually win games. Drinker of Blood. The ultimate goal of Drinker of Blood decks is to stall the game until you can Zombie Apocalypse or Wave Transformation off turn to create a bunch of two defense tokens, and then on turn play Drinker of Blood followed immediately by Wither or Flash Fire to break all of those tokens and deal a ton of damage from Drinker Triggers. If this doesn't outright kill your opponent, the health gain will ideally give you enough time to go off again to finish the job. Without this or similar combos, Drinker of Blood is just too slow and too fragile to be worthwhile. The best way to stop Drinker decks is to ensure that your opponent can never start their turn with a significant number of small champions in play controlled by either player. Discard Pile Removal slows down the combo as well by disrupting key cards. Health Gain can also enable you to get out of range of a single average combo, forcing them to either go bigger or to go off multiple times. Soul Hunter. While initially entered the meta as a reaction to the popularity of Alt Blocker, as a top tier card in its own right because it's the I can win without ever playing a card card. In Epic, playing a card first, particularly a one cost card, is a big risk. If you do it, you open yourself up to your pump doing something better while your gold is down and then starting their turn from that position. For example, surprise attack into Kong after you spend your gold is devastating. So is an unmitigated bot blocker. For wild decks, Brachiosaurus and T-Rex are strong enough to be worth taking that risk, but other decks would happily pass initiative without spending their gold each turn until their opponent plays something first, or they reach seven or more cards in hand. If you have Soul Hunter, you can pass at 8 cards in hand, and if your opponent also passes, you get to discard your Soul Hunter to hand size. Then, your opponent will be forced to do something, otherwise you'll get Soul Hunter to play for free on your next turn. If both players continue to do nothing, you win after attacking 6 times, having never played a single card. All that being said, this is an exceptionally rare, hypothetical possibility that is currently not actively pursued or even acknowledged as a realistic possibility by most players. But there are a lot of constructed epic tactics underexplored at this point. Beyond that though, even if you ignore its ultimate never play a card first status, it can still be quite powerful if the meta consists of discard effects and or you are able to discard it to other cards or by drawing enough cards to discard it to hand size. This can also be particularly strong against big non-breakthrough champions like T-Rex. Soul Hunter lock against T-Rex happened at Worlds 2016. It's a real thing. However, the card's greatest weakness, aside from discard power removal of course, is that as a slow 5-5 champion with no immediate effect when played, it is almost always terrible to actually spend a gold on your turn to play it, against decks that don't force you to discard and do pressure you too much to overdraw, this can effectively be a dead card. Okay, now it's time to talk about Chamberlain Kark, currently the only card with an alternate win condition. It is the most controversial card in the game because it encourages hyper-defensive control decks, and because it dominated both Worlds 2016 and the next couple of tournaments at following it. Kark is inherently powerful because if you're at 60 health or close enough with loyalty X and play this, you win. It allows decks to be 100% defensive and win by gaining health, which they actively want to do, instead of by dealing damage, which is generally just done incidentally. Also, since the win condition isn't tied to loyalty, any control deck can use it as a finisher, even if it's their only one cost good card. However, if you are playing heavy good and you can draw enough cards to hit a big 7 plus loyalty X reveal, you can win from 46 health or lower, particularly when you add zero cost health gain into the equation. This makes it particularly strong against decks that don't apply much pressure since it gives you plenty of time to draw. 
Hulk's biggest inherent weakness is that, similar to Flame Strike, it usually just isn't worth playing unless it immediately wins you the game. It's just a slow champion without Airborne that doesn't immediately affect the board. Sad. Particularly if you can't reveal many cards for Loyalty Axe. Also, if it's your only way to win, playing one of your max 3 copies could seriously delay and therefore compromise that ability to win. While a 9-12 body is certainly quite reasonable, it still just isn't worth it if you're not getting great effect from it. In general though, this is just another win condition for control decks, and control decks have been around since the first competitive constructed event, long before Kark. At least now, Control v Control has a definitive endpoint. It did directly display the raw power of Blind Faith and Cease Fire though, leading to their bans along with Fumble, and I'll definitely reference it when talking about other cards, but any more I could say about it now would be broadly applicable to most all control decks. I have written more about it in the past though, if you want more content on it. One final point, even if you are a card deck, that doesn't mean you can't win by beating your opponent down to zero. And now that I've finally finished talking about Kark, we've gotten to the final control deck win condition, Skara's Gift. John Tatine used this card to defend his world championship title in 2017. He won with Kark the previous year. Skara's Gift allows control decks to focus all their gold on drawing cards and preventing their opponent from gaining control of the board. While doing this, Scar's Gift can be played and then immediately recalled to slowly chip away your opponent's health while bolstering your own. Unless your opponent has health gain, they have a max of 15 inevitable Scar's Gift plays with which to win the game. While quite powerful, it does have a couple of weaknesses. For one, only evil cards trigger its recall effect, obviously, so you generally need to go pretty heavy into evil to actually support it which brings in all of evil's general weaknesses. It does also effectively eliminate any other use for your discard pile, such as recursion or recycling, since it churns through your discard pile to feed itself. Further, your opponent can theoretically starve it with banish effects and or repetitive discard pile banish effects, but since you generally use Scar's Gift as soon as you have two cards in your discard pile to banish, Mass discard pile banished effects like Amnesia that are just one-time use aren't actually that effective against it. Important to note though, using this to banish your own cards like Ancient Chant to fulfill its cost will still trigger their leaves your discard pile effect. These four cards enable control decks to exist by giving them a way to incidentally win while drawing cards, gaining health, and disrupting their opponent's attempts to win. Even though they only represent a small percentage of decks played, they have a high tournament win conversion rate. This can partially be explained by the fact that they are difficult to play well, which can make it hard for players with minimal access to the currently small competitive community to prepare for them, but they are also inherently quite powerful. One of the many reasons evil-based control decks see play is because they can take advantage of the remaining evil-only top-tier cards. Medusa. It is to evil what Raging T-Rex is to wild. If you're playing evil, you want three, period. Off-turn removal, attached to a reasonable one-cost body that takes a gold to remove and is strong against or with bounce. This can consistently get you ahead when your opponent's gold is down, allowing you to play reactively behind it which is a very powerful position to be in in Epic. Medusa has no inherent weaknesses, however, Evil as a whole has historically had poor card draw, which held Medusa back quite a bit. But Evil has been getting some new tools to address that. Next, Rift Summoner, aka 1717 worth of ambush stats, assuming you have a plentiful dead or something similar. With the ability to keep pumping out demons. Even with just loyalty, it starts with more stats than the vanilla ambush champion, and it's spread out over three bodies, which is usually better, especially for attacking. The fact that you can then get even further ahead with this makes it nuts. And 
since you can expend Rift Summoner during combat, you can do tricky things like attack, draw out an opponent's blocker, then break your attacking champion that was going to break anyway and do nothing to get a free flip with your two demons, and the same thing works with blocking as well. Rift Summoner can even break cards that want to be broken, like Soul Hunter, or cards you want to recur. This is one of the most powerful off-turn gold punishers in the game on a similar level to Surprise Attack Kong and Thought Plucker. The main weakness of this card, though, is that it is just stats, and it can be fully removed for no benefit by any one cost board clear, which makes it much worse when your opponent's gold is up, but a one cost ambush card that forces a board clear by itself is still pretty decent. Xanos Corpse Lord is Evil's other top tier token creating threat, and it provides some incidental damage with health gain as well. Not only does it immediately get you closer to winning and further from losing, but the huge amount of bodies it can produce is great for both attacking and defending. For those reasons, if your evil deck can get up to 6 plus evil cards in hand, this can be difficult to beat, especially if you can keep recurring it. On the flip side, if your evil deck gets down to just a few cards in hand, this can be next to worthless, since a slow 1 cost 9-9 nine nine with no effect is absolute garbage. And now for my favorite top tier evil card, Scar's Will. Scar's Will is powerful because it enables evil decks to do a lot of things they struggle with. Mainly, it can break a champion without spending your only gold for the turn. This is particularly important against top tier Brachiosaurus. Further, since it doesn't target, it can even break untargetable champions like top tier Sea Titan. But the most important part is that it allows you to have a strong effect on the board and then pass with your gold up. If your opponent plays a threat, you can remove it. If they do something non-threatening, you can draw. Or you can play your own uncontested threat. And if they pass, you've safely extended the game while also getting an evil ally trigger and getting a card in your discard pile. The other massive strength of this card, which can be easily overlooked, is that it's an actually playable one cost or draw two in evil. This is incredibly important for having enough card draw and a heavy evil deck, and it gives you more ability to trigger evil ally effects particularly when you are ahead on board, which is important because zero-cost cards with an or draw two effect don't trigger ally abilities. Also, it's important that its or effect is so strong because even a just one human token effectively just turns off its main effect, so if tokens get popular, this will become much, much worse. The final top tier evil only card is Necromancer Lord, and just like fellow top tier card Thought Plucker, it dies to everything. But when played, it gets you back the situationally best champion in any discard pile, and if not removed, it threatens to do it again on each of your turns. Getting two or more one cost champions back with one gold is insane. But even just getting one one-cost champion back and forcing a removal effect is still quite powerful. Necrolord is also a great target for final task to return any other champion to play off turn without that return champion breaking, since you can target your Necrolord and then use the Necrolord ability to recur that champion. Important to note, since final task inherently gives blitz, you don't need to reveal for loyalty if you return a Necromancer Lord to play, but neither would your opponent if they're the one playing Final Task on your Necro Lord. While this card is incredibly and obviously strong on paper, it does have major weaknesses. First off, if there are no champions in any discard pile, it's worthless, which also means it's terrible at the beginning of the game. Second, if your opponent knows you have this, they can prioritize recycling any of their worthwhile champions for you to take, in addition to potentially banishing yours when or before they hit your discard pile. Third, 
as a slow champion that generally wants to hit other powerful slow champions to be worth an on-turn gold, this can rot in your hand for a while. And drawing multiple copies at the wrong time can be devastating. However, if you can use Necrolord to bring back another Necrolord to then bring back something immediately useful, you can apply a lot of pressure to your opponent. In addition to these evil only top tier cards, there are also two generic top tier evil cards. First up, Drain Essence, the most prevalent alignment independent card in constructed play, or at least one of them. You consider it because it's health gain. You run it because it's fast and affects the board. The reason health gain is so important is because direct damage is effectively unpreventable. And without health gain, you can't prevent yourself from being burned out over multiple turns with multiple golds. For example, if your opponent is able to survive all of your attacks on your turn, they can play a one cost burn event targeting you at the end of your turn. Then on their turn, they can play a second one cost burn event targeting you. Finally, as soon as you declare your first attack on your next turn, before you can deal any attacking damage, they can play a third one cost burn event targeting you. And if all of those were flame strikes or lesson learns, that's 24 damage in between your ability to damage your opponent by attacking. And that's without including zero cost burn cards. Let that sink in for a second. Now if you have Drain Essence, as soon as they play that second one cost burn event on their turn, you can follow that up by playing Drain Essence to remove one of their champions, gain 9 health, and get you out of range of that third one cost burn event potentially coming on your turn. This means that you'll survive at least through your next turn, which gives you enough time to get those final attacks through to win before you die. Health gain can also give you extra turns against chip damage decks like Scar's Gift. The reason this beats out other health gain cards is because it's bundled with fast removal. Using it lets you break a potential attacker or even a potential blocker. Mid-range decks, for instance, can't afford to spend a gold just gaining health because they need to constantly apply pressure, but this can win them control of the board and get some damage through. The main weakness of this card are that it does not include a draw 2 option, it can be built around by not including worthwhile 9 or less defense targets, it's not great against Kark or other control decks, and it's much worse if you have to play it while your opponent's gold is up. Playing a Drain Essence just to get Strafing Dragon doesn't accomplish much, since your opponent will still have a one cost threat in play. All that being said, unless you are a hyper aggressive deck, or you already have some other means of health gain, it's always worth considering including all three copies. A great non-evil only zero cost card to go with your Drain Essences is Roxas Curse. Break Muse and get a demon, sold. Draw two attached, nice. In all seriousness though, this card severely oppresses zero cost champions without immediate effects. In limited formats like Dark Draft, zero cost champions, particularly with Blitz, are great because you can have an unlimited number, and you can use them to pressure your opponent without spending your gold. In Constructed, however, your deck is limited to a max of one-third zero-cost cards. Therefore, each individual zero is much more precious. So, if you try to play a Blitz Zero to pressure your opponent without spending your gold in Constructed, and your opponent breaks it and gets a Demon, they've managed to flip that dynamic on you, and you only have so many more zeros left in your deck to get it back. As long as Roxas Curse remains popular, constructed zero-cost champion decks won't be. 
The main problem of Rax's Curse, though, is that it can't hit one-cost champions. Which I know sounds crazy, but it's true. Specifically, it can't hit incidental one-cost champions, like Mistguide Herald or Brachiosaurus, and it can't hit small high-value champions like Thought Plucker or Necromancer Lord. These are real concerns, and it means other small removal, zero-cost cards can fight for this card's spot in a deck. The draw 2 option is a big advantage over some of those cards, though. Overall, the main weaknesses of the top tier evil cards, both evil exclusive and not evil exclusive, is the lack of effective supporting in alignment card draw. There is no top tier evil draw 2 and card, and many of these cards rely on having large hand sizes for cards in your discard pile to be worthwhile. If you can address those problems and you can survive against wild, evil has a lot of power though. And now, I finally get to talk about the top tier good exclusive cards, my pet alignment particularly for my mid-range decks. Noble Unicorn. This is the closest to a Medusa T-Rex level auto-include that good has. Ambush champions are strong, drawing cards is strong, and unicorn is both. Not only can the 6-6 body be a threat, particularly with buffs, but the draw an extra card every turn on a body that can't be effectively removed by a zero cost card is a major threat. This card can even exceed the Mew's spendless gold to draw effect, however, it does require a continual flow of one cost good cards to do it. But the draw an extra card effect is so strong that after playing Unicorn as an off turn gold punisher, I'm actually willing to immediately spend my gold first on my next turn to make sure that I get it, at least against some specific decks. The two major problems with Noble Unicorn, however, are both due to it not being quite big enough. A 6-6 body doesn't win many combats by itself, and it can neither stop nor outrace bigger champions, particularly since it doesn't have evasion, and Smash and Burn is seriously keeping it down due to its ability to incidentally clear off the Unicorn, even though technically if you get two draws off the Unicorn, you come out net ahead, since the Unicorn ends up in your discard pile while Smash and Burn gets banished. On the cusp of being absolutely amazing though. Next up is a card that I was not expecting I would include in top tier when I began. Angel of Light. It gains 10 health, which is even more than the ever popular Drain Essence, and it is attached to an airborne ambush body. For control decks, specifically Kark, 10 health with an incidental airborne blocker that your opponent doesn't want to bounce, which means it can't be effectively, effectively removed with a zero cost card, is basically one of the best things you could ask for. It unconditionally and quickly advances you towards your win condition, and it protects that win condition. For mid-range decks, the 10 health can give you that same extra turn against burn or other aggressive decks that Drain Essence can, but it also gives you an evasive threat to actually kill your opponent, or at least force them to spend a gold to remove it later, enabling you to play another gold punisher. Once again though, similar to Unicorn, its body is just a bit too small by itself. Not only does it break to smash and burn, which sucks, but it also loses in the air to almost everything, specifically Strafing Dragon. Finally though, we have the one top tier good exclusive card that actually has a killer body, Silverwing Savior. As someone who's played a lot of the fringe good mid-range decks, you can trust me when I say this card is absolutely insane. It's everything good has been looking for in a mid-range aggressive deck. 7-7 Seven -seven Airborne Blitz is an excellent on-turn gold punisher because it hits hard, it has evasion, and it's durable. Not only can it survive zero cost removal, but it's also strong in airborne combat, specifically against Scraping Dragon, and it even survives Smash and Burn! 
You can also be an establishing champion to an empty board since you effectively draw a card when playing it, and both of these things on turn Gold Punisher and Establishing Champion make it particularly resilient to bounce effects. Further, the ability to selectively return any good alignment card you've already played this game is huge. Priest of Kalamor specifically has been amazing because its recurring health gain, another chump block, and protection against removal, even against hasty retreat. Resurrection is also great because if you play Resurrection to bring back Silverwing Savior, Savior's tribute ability waits to resolve until Resurrection completely finishes resolving and enters your discard pile. Therefore, Savior can then legally choose that Resurrection to return to hand, which can effectively create a never-ending loop returning an evasive, hard-to-answer, blitzing threat assuming Savior isn't banished before you can play Resurrection, of course. Aside from those two specific cards, returning other good zeros is great, as is the ability to return a draw two, an off-turn threat, etc, etc. <sighs> and that is all 31 top-tier cards for Epic Constructed, up through the first four packs of Pantheon. Hope you enjoyed it, thanks for watching, and I'd love to hear what you think about them in the comments below. Is my bias showing in putting Silverwing Savior into top tier? Or maybe there's another card that deserves to be up here as well. Let me know. Until then, have a good one.